Welcome to Bread and Roses, everyone. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bouskouya. In this week's program, we'll be talking about the ban on several nationalities as well as uh, Muslim profiling, basically, by the horrendous Donald Trump. We'll also talk about an insane fatwa on how it's all right to cheat in your English exams. And that's from Saudi Arabia. Of course, where else? And we've got our wonderful slice of life, uh, which is the resistance, both legal and on the streets, against Donald Trump's racist ban and attack on refugee rights. Yes, and this week's interview is with Hamid Sabi, one of the lawyers of Iran Tribunal, on the purpose of this campaign and what does Iran Tribunal mean for justice for people of Iran. Stay with us, don't go away. Now we all know that Donald Trump has issued executive orders banning several nationalities, including Iran, from entry into the United States and also stopping refugee resettlement for a set period of time. There's, it's, it's likely that he wants to extend that. And the absurd justification for this racist policy is that it will help to secure the U.S.'s borders and it will stop terrorism. And of course, there's no connection between the two. And I think we need to talk about that more, don't we? Yeah, I think um, the issue of linking uh, refugees with uh, terrorism, um, whether said or uh, uh, unspoken, um, everybody's sort of believing, is constantly being driven by the media for, for many, many years now. It's, it seems that like it's accepted fact. There isn't, imagine uh, during the um, Irish uh, um, war, Northern Ireland, you had the um, IRA um, taking up arms um, struggle and, and fighting and terrorist um, activities to achieve its political aim. To link that with all of the um, Irish people, it was morally wrong and actually did not help to resolve any of the issues. And with the Islamist sort of movement, it's exactly the same. If you link it with the refugees, you are missing the point. Um, not only you carry on discriminating against the whole section of uh, society, but you're not actually targeting and focusing all the resources yeah, I mean, on dealing with, with terrorism. Especially if you look at the facts. Now, none of the nationalities that have been banned have been involved in fatal attacks in the United States since 9-11. Even if they were, it's those specific terrorists that need to be criminalized and prosecuted and, you know, sentenced. That's what a fair justice system looks like. You can't just blanketly blame everyone who has one or several of yeah. the characteristics of someone who's a terrorist. Yeah. And usually terrorism is not individual act. Terrorism usually is organized, it has huge backup organization, states, you know, infrastructure. And the terrorist movement, it's known, majority of the terrorist movement is known to the security forces. They know where the sources are. They've been monitored regularly and they need to deal with those specific and... Pro so when we talk about sort of behavioral pro uh, uh, profiling, yeah. this is what is aiming to a specific organization. When you start profiling or dealing with the whole nation, for example... A race or nationality. Everybody from Iran coming, you know, being banned from entering the United States and, you know, that might be extended by the... Right wing in Europe, you know, banning everybody coming from Middle East. It's just, first of all, it's impossible. It's impossible, but actually distracts and divert the attention from the real issue of yeah. dealing with terrorism. Yeah. Now, the other issue is that most of the attacks in the United States, all of them, the, the ones that have created the most killings have been from white supremacist groups. And it's also been all via citizens and residents of the United States. So if we follow Trump's logic, does that mean that everyone who's white, that everyone who's a citizen, that everyone who's a resident should be barred from the United States? The fact that it's linked to immigration and refugee status, that's what makes it racist. People don't get this idea because they would never agree with a blanket ban on citizens or on all white people, but it's perfectly fine when it comes to migrants and refugees. Yeah, and I think that's the core of the issue. Yeah. Actually, it's, it's futile, yeah. it's wrong, morally wrong as well, and it's destructive because it, it, cre it is pushing a different agenda. It's not pushing the agenda of fighting terrorism, yeah. it's pushing, pushing a right-wing anti-immigrant 
you know, sowing the seeds of division within society, which aims for something else, not fighting terrorism. So anybody who actually push, pushes the argument of fighting terrorism by banning uh, uh, refugees are not, you know, dealing with the issue of, um, of confronting terrorism. Yeah, definitely. And also it places collective blame. I mean, we've talked about this before. If you ban someone from Iran, you're banning people like Faribors and myself, you know. Uh, yes, of course, you have, uh, you know, the Iranian regime. You've, you've got officials who are terrorists, uh, obviously. You've got you know, the Saudi government is leading, uh, you know, one of the leading terrorists in the world. You've got Erdogan, which is supportive of terrorist movements. These states, some of them have really good relations with the West. And by blaming migrants and refugees, you sort of allow those who have this sort of a real role yeah, in, yeah. in promoting terrorism. It's as if they're not to blame. It's just, you know, migrants and, and refugees. And I think that, that, that's the key issue um, that we've been sort of arguing through this program. And we want to highlight this and we'll continue to highlight this issue. Yeah, but uh, just one final point is when you have people who are atheists and secularists defending the profiling of Muslims or defending, you know, the sort of banning of certain nationalities, they're feeding into this right wing narrative and they are feeding into a situation which they also need to look at, you know, how it helps to create a climate that makes racism that makes bigotry acceptable, normalized, and that's something that we need to resist. We need to be able to fight terrorism, at the same time defend people's rights, citizenship rights, human rights, irrespective of people's nationalities or their immigration status. Last week I had the opportunity to interview Hamid Sabi, one of the lawyers of Iran Tribunal, who was speaking at the launch of Iran Tribunal book, a campaign which has worked tirelessly for a few years to document the crimes of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Yeah, I mean, it's such an amazing uh, campaign, isn't it? And it, it, this book was documenting the work that has been done. And of course, Hamid Sabi has been one of the most, you know, instrumental of the, the lawyers who's been pushing forward this movement for justice, you know, and accountability for those who uh, were massacred during the 80s for some sort of uh, justice for their families and yeah. loved ones. And, and this is um, uh, one of the important uh, campaigns um, in Iran and Middle East. It's the first time that formally an international uh, group of lawyers have uh, looked at the evidence presented by families, uh, relatives, and some people who suffered under the Islamic Republic of Iran in the 1980s and actually condemned them as uh, uh, breaching not only the human rights law, but actually committing crime against humanity. And that's it's so important. And do this documentation, I think, is just a scene for further on unpicking of the crimes of the Islamists in Middle East and, and North Africa. Yeah, and I mean, and the other thing too is that it's really important to document these things because when you live in a theocracy like Iran, where it's a dictatorship, and so many of its crimes are hidden from view, they're you know they're secret crimes really. I think Hamid mentions that in his interview uh, that to be able to bring these crimes to the surface for the whole world to see is a hugely important feat, and it's important for any society in order to. Be able to move forward is to know what happened in its past, to hold those who have committed such grave crimes accountable, and to really focus on not revenge, but really justice, getting justice, yeah. justice not just for the families, but for all Iranians, you know, who've, who've had to live through this dark history. Yeah, and I think the world must know what's happened and is happening under the Islamic regime mm -hmm. of Iran. I don't think the extent of the crimes that's been committed in Iran and any society that is under the boot of the Islamist, it's not, it, 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 people don't know. And I think that this is just a moment in the history of Iran that has been documented. Yeah, so, listen uh, to what Hamid Sabi has to say right now. It's a really interesting interview. Stay with us. Mr. Sabi, thank you very much for taking part in this Breton Roses interview. We've just taken part in the uh, launch of the Iran Tribunal book in London. 
could you tell us briefly what were the key points of Iran Tribunal and for its formation and its aim and objective? Iran Tribunal was established in order to seek justice for victims of the crimes committed by Islamic Republic of Iran against them, in particular in 1980s. What has to be recognized is that the Islamic Republic made a significant effort to keep this matter and the massacre of political prisoners as a secret of state. None of the relatives of the victims were allowed to advertise or tell anyone as to the events. The graves were unmarked. The mothers tried to discover where the graves are and they were beaten up. And any activity inside Iran was quashed so that this matter is kept as one of the most important secrets of the <coughs> regime. What Iran Tribunal did from day one, it broke that silence. Not only it broke it inside Iran and a lot of people in Iran who didn't know anything about this got to know about it, but also outside. The political prisoners, the, the relatives of the victims were kept for 25 years in total silence, which was an additional torture. The, the effect of Iran tribunal was that they could come out, talk about it, give interviews, attend sessions, and also freely talk about what happened to their loved ones or to themselves. That was one of the main achievements, I, I guess, and it had a, an impact in Iran. Hundreds of thousands of people watched, actually, the process of Iran tribunal. A lot of people responded very well. <clears throat> and also, when Mr. Khamenei responded through one of the regime's sites that he had tried to stop the killings. <coughs> Secondly, it had a major cathartic event, uh, effect on, on the victims. These were the people who were tortured or lost their relatives and were not able to talk about it. For the first time, there was a public hearing where people could attend and they could talk about the events and what happened to them or their relatives. And that was a great event for them. I think it was also a major achievement that this matter was dealt with. And thirdly, I hope we, we have achieved a positive movement on, on the side of bringing justice to the concept of these crimes that were committed by the regime, bringing shame to, what, what, to the perpetrators and also bringing some confidence in the victims that they can stand up here, as you've seen today, and talk about what happened to them and continue with their justice-seeking efforts. Yes, and one of the uh, um, features of the tribunal has been um, demanding justice with no revenge. And it's the first time at the same time that the Islamist movement, movement in Middle East and North Africa, actually its crime has been documented. And the relationship between this and the movement for not seeking revenge but justice, how do you see that sort of in a broader uh, impact on the future of Iranian society and larger Middle Eastern society. I hope Iran Tribunal would be instrumental in putting an end to the cycle of revenge and violence. The Shah's regime committed, although at much lower level, violence against its own citizens and executions and suppression of the opposition groups. People were hoping that the new regime would change this, but eventually it ended up being far worse than the Shah's regime, with violence originally against the leaders of the previous regime, but then it can sp spread around all those who opposed the regime, one way or another, were also tortured, imprisoned, and it all culminated in massacre of political prisoners in 1988, which is a disaster for Iranian history. I mean, this is an unmitigated disaster, and at one stage, those who have committed it has to stand up and pay for it. But it is essential in all justice-seeking movements that it is not for revenge. 
revenge would destroy the whole purpose of justice. It is our hope that one day these people are brought to trial, the perpetrators are given all the rights that is recognized under international law, there will be a fair and due process, everybody will have access to defense counsel, everybody would be allowed to make a statement, everybody would be allowed to submit any evidence they want. So we do hope that one day we will bring these people to justice, and that's the purpose, not the revenge and not the execution. Iran Tribunal and all those who participated in it are totally against the capital punishment and we hope that that will be eradicated as well. Uh, what's next for Iran Tribunal? You mentioned in your speech earlier uh, in a meeting that you'll have sort of wa watchtower or... <laughs> we do have a watchdog committee for each section uh, in each country that we, we have members. Their purpose is to collect evidence and information as to the movement of the perpetrators that are, that are listed in the report. And if they happen to come out of Iran, we try to arrest them in Western countries where there, there is possibility of doing that. We carry out researches as to the legal requirements in the UK and uh, Sweden and other countries where there may be some uh, visit by these perpetrators. And hopefully, once there is a regime change, we can also submit the same evidence and information to the authorities in Iran and bring these people to a proper justice. Thank you very much for taking part in the Bread and Roses interview and best wishes for the future. Thank you very much. Thanks. The insane fatwa is from Abdul Rahman Ben Nasser Al Barak. Very okay. long, long name for a stupid, stupid fatwa. Stupid fatwa. And he's, he's from Saudi Arabia. He is well known in the fatwa, stu stupid fatwa circle. Very well known. And he's issued a fatwa which says that it's perfectly fine to cheat on your English exam. <laughs> English. Not other exams, but your English exam. Do you know why? <laughs> why? Like, before, before we get to reasons, this guy sits on the. <laughs> Uh, scientific committee of Riyadh University. Oh no, how this surprising. Is any, this is not any stupid sort of, well, he's a stupid, but it's not any other sort well, of mullah who has no ranking. This guy sits on the top of the scientific committee of Riyadh University. And rightfully so, because he, he has some very good reasons for why you can cheat on your English exam. And he said, because English is poison and corrupt. Of course. That's why you can cheat. And also the other reason is other people have tried to justify why he's done that. So look, it's hard. Everybody fails <laughs> in English exam. <laughs> so you it's fail. okay to cheat because you need to you need to pass your exam. You need so to pass this corrupt language. Yes, mm. I know. Mm. It's it's silly. Insane. It's, we've got more fatwa from him. Shall I? We'll next leave week. That, we'll leave that for next week. Don't tell them everything okay. now. Stupid fatwa. The a Beautiful Slice of Life this week is from the United States and it is the wonderful resistance of people at airports with their placards calling for people to be allowed into the United States. Lawyers who are sitting there pro bono trying to help people get into the US. It is really a beautiful sight to see. And, and this is America. This is America that I recognize. This is America that everybody looks up to and that's that's the land of liberty. But that's what the, these, these people make America a land of liberty. And that's what everybody is attracted to. Not Donald Trump. Um, and that's that's the thing. The issue is that a lot of Iranians, for example, that I know, that my friends on Facebook and various social media, they're seeing a lot of the friends, family, colleagues who work with them have come and they reassure them that, you know, they uh, Trump doesn't uh, represent uh, America. And the video is circul circulating in the um, social media and saying that the Iranian people and pe people from uh, America are friends and they have nothing to go into war for, you know. And that's the 
beauty of um, humanity. And also we've know. got, uh, uh, you know, judges in the United States who have held this uh, one judge in particular in Seattle who said that uh, the uh, banning of nationals and stopping the refugees uh, from entering the U.S. is unconstitutional. And of course, Donald Trump. So this is he is referred to him as a so-called judge. So-called judge. And I'm sure mm -hmm. he'll say so-called constitution and so-called liberty and try mm. to sort of wipe all of these away from from America. Yeah. But yeah. you know. But, but it's you know, it was a wonderful sight to see, and especially yeah. after really the racism and brutality of Donald Trump's executive orders, uh, you know, to see this humanity, you know, challenge it. It gives you hope. It gives you lots and lots of hope, and that's what slice of life is all about, isn't it? Anyway, we've reached the end of our program. We we hope you have a wonderful week and we'll see you again at the same time and same place next week. Goodbye. Goodbye. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.